Today, a talented actor, Stephen Culp, who was Major Hayes on Star Trek Enterprise. Here's my conversation. It's, it's great to talk to you. I mean, I, I first saw you as Major Hayes and uh, on Star Trek Enterprise, mm -hmm. uh, and you've had some great parts since. What I'd like to start off is uh, talking about the theater work you're doing now, uh, the play The Quality of Life, working with uh, two great actresses, Laurie Metcalf yeah, and Joe yeah. Beth Williams. They're just, they're just fantastic. Uh, interestingly enough, you know, this, this play was originally done, you know, it, it's still somewhat of a work in progress. Um, you know, uh, Jane Anderson, who wrote and directed it, is still developing it. And, you know, there are producers who are interested in taking it to New York. So we'll see how that goes in the current economy. They did it at the little – the original production was done last fall at the little 100-seat uh, second space at the Geffen Theater in uh, Los Angeles. And interestingly enough, it was the same cast – Joe Beth Williams, Laurie Metcalf, Dennis Boutsikaris, except Scott Bakula played the part I'm playing. <laughs> so, you know, interesting coincidence there. Yeah, it is. It is kind of uh, interesting yeah, the way it plays yeah. itself out. But it's but we've opened here. You know, the reviews have all been great. Um, we're we're at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, which is one of the big regional theaters here at uh, the Geary Theater. You know, it's a typical regional theater run: a month of rehearsal and a month of performance, and then that's done, which is which is good because that's kind of all you can afford. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One thing that hasn't changed in 20 years is theater money. You know, it's yeah. it's, um, it's almost like you're taking time off uh, to to do something like this. But it, it's really been worth it. It's it's an incredible play, and the audiences have been eating it up, and the cast is just great to work with. Yeah, those are first-rate actresses. So I mean, yeah. I can only yeah. imagine uh, you, you have to be on your A game, as you say. <laughs> Otherwise, well, I, I, it, it's a good group. I mean, you know, Dennis Butzkaris is, he, you know, he's won a bunch of Obie Awards in yes. New York, and he's, you know, he's no slouch. And uh, I think, you know, between the four of us, we we make a pretty good team. That's great. Uh, one of the things that um, and I, actually I. I interviewed another actress who's in this movie as well. She played Jackie Kennedy um, uh, in, oh. thir in 13 Days. Uh, right, right. Yeah. So what, did you, uh, what did you interview her? Well, it turns out she was in uh, – she played Lila on uh, – Stephanie Romanoff, she played Lila on Angel. So, uh -huh. so I interviewed her about that, and we talked okay. about 13 Days. So. Yeah, yeah. She really – you know, they, they kind of wrote that part in as an afterthought because, mm -hmm. you know, people just thought – you can't have this movie without seeing Jackie. Mm -hmm. And she just had, I think, you know, one little scene, and I think you saw her in church at some point. But she was so vivid just in that brief appearance that, uh, you know, you really remember her. She, mm -hmm. she's, she's lovely. And you played Bobby Kennedy, and yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, that was, uh, that was a great film, especially the, your give and take with Bruce Greenwood as the yeah. president, um, yeah. as yeah. Kennedy. Yeah, we had a really we had a really nice relationship going. I had auditioned with him a number of times, and then um, after he was cast, they they had me screen test with him, and uh, so we and we had some friends in common. So immediately after I was cast, we just started calling each other periodically, you know, talking about what we were researching and you know what were we doing and you know how are you preparing because we had about five weeks before the movie actually started shooting and. What we would do was we would talk to each other in our accents because uh, we found that, you know, the, the tonally uh, JFK's and Bobby's voices were, were very different from each other. You know, Bobby's was much higher pitched and mm -hmm. there was you know, sort of a different rhythm. And, and we found originally that when we were, you know, uh, screen testing together and stuff that we'd start to drift toward each other's accents. You know, I'd start sounding like him. He'd start sounding like me. So we, we, so we practiced on the phone, talking to each other in the accent, so we could get, get used to it. And uh, you know, with one thing and another, by the time we we got to actually filming it, we just had, you know, I, I really did feel like we were there was a very brotherly thing going on there. Yeah, it showed on the screen. It really was. Yeah. It, was it was actually a film that you know I, I really, really dug, and uh, you know, living through that history, I remember it very well. I was just a kid, but it was. Uh, it was, we came close to World War Three, and that yeah, movie bears yeah, that out. Yeah, it really did. I, and and you know, even closer than, you know, there was more. There were more stones in the road, in reality, than they could fit into the script. Mm -hmm. And then there was there was more in the script that finally had to be cut for time. But there were a lot of impediments and a lot of close calls there, and it's it's kind of amazing. And, and 
you know, despite the fact that I'm in the movie, I really love the movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I when and people still come up to me. I don't know. Supposedly the movie was didn't make all that much money, uh, but it sure seems like a lot of people saw it because I, I still get people coming up to me and telling me how much they like the movie. And that's one thing I'm just really proud of. I'm, I'm proud of being in that movie, and I'm proud of that movie. And just the story of some world leaders who were fighting not to go to war, mm-hmm. I think – is and and fighting the establishment in America that that wants to go to war is just a very timely and inspiring story and uh, I wish it was something that people took more to heart in this day and age. Yeah, I hear you there. Uh, but yeah, actually, if uh, you know, for the conspiracy theorists, there is just enough tension between Kennedy and the military where you know the kind of feed the theories that the military had something to do with his death they you know it was actually showed a little bit of that in the movie so it's certainly like no oh, you could see well, that I, as a yeah, case but that conspiracy theories aside the mm-hmm. tension was there oh yeah and yeah he was still smarting over having been sold a bill of goods on the bay of pigs oh sure and that's why he got john McCone uh, to uh, in the head of the cia i mean cuz it was just you know the cia was just a, a wreck yeah and you know, Bobby wrote in his book, 13 Days, that, you know, the Monday after the crisis was over, the military was felt like they'd been robbed. You know, they wanted to go in and invade anyway. And, you know, he, he writes, he says, it just doesn't, he just doesn't understand that way of thinking. Mm, you know? Yeah, yeah um, I hear you. But it, but it persists. Yep, it sure does. Unfortunately, it does. Yeah. One one of the roles that you did, uh, I mean, you, you, you really stepped into a show that, really, really took off in its first season on Desperate Housewives. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, I mean, did you did you all sense anything on the set when you were making it that it was going to turn into something big? Or um, I can't speak for anybody. You know, I, I can't speak for everybody else. Sure. I just personally, I thought that it was it was this unusual hybrid that was probably going to was not edgy enough for cable and was probably going to be too weird for the network. That was my opinion. Mm-hmm. And then when all this critical buzz started, I thought, oh, well, terrific. We'll be like Arrested Development or something, and we'll get a couple seasons, you know, and nobody will watch, but we'll have, you know, we'll have like critical cachet. What I didn't realize was how deeply the characters and especially the wives would resonate with with people everywhere, uh, you know, my own wife, uh, just, you know, there was, there was, she just saw so much of, you know, you know, with, with the way Lynette dealt with her kids and, you know, it's just, it's it just, there's something for everybody to relate to. But I, but I do know that we were, when we were filming before we aired, it was a very hard tone to catch. And, uh, fortunately, you know, ABC, uh, I, I think really believed in the show and they, kept pumping money into it and there were a lot of especially in the first season there were there were many scenes that after we filmed them and they saw them they went oh now we know what this should be and they would rewrite the scene and we'd reshoot it and it was a, and sometimes uh, they'd reshoot a scene because just to get the tone of a performance more the way it was supposed to be but it was this very interesting line between playing it for real but also having the farce in mind it was a it was a hybrid I, that most of us had never. It was it was a whole new thing. Oh yeah. And and now it seems very common. You know, <laughs> you, when you when you look at uh, a lot of the shows, especially on ABC, they seem to you know to come from the Desperate Housewives template. You know, it's it's uh, the same kind of rhythm in the editing, the same kind of music. You know, bloop, 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 cut the commercial. You know, the same mix of comedy and drama and. Um, but, and that all comes from Desperate Housewives, yeah. it seems to me, you know, yeah. and, then, and then Grey's Anatomy. But mm-hmm. when Grey's Anatomy first aired, they, they tinkered with it to make it more like Desperate Housewives and Tongue. But, I rem- but we were all not quite sure if we were getting it or not. And I remember this one day, went to post-production to loop uh, just some, like, laughter in a scene at a dinner table where, where Bree says, says something very private about Rex uh, to the group of people. And mm-hmm. um, I don't know if I can say this on this, you know, I, yeah. I, I'm avoiding the word because uh, <laughs> I don't know what venue I'm, I'm speaking in here, but I don't want to get you in trouble. But anyway, you probably remember the scene. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I went to post-production and 
the people in post-production, you know, who were in the looping room, were saying things like, do you guys know what you have here? This is like lightning in a bottle. This is so great. And I, and I immediately went back the next day and told everybody on the set, and they were like, really? Whew, you know, wow, great. <laughs> but then, but then the series premiered, and and I don't think anybody you'd have been crazy if you'd have predicted that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. You can't predict that. And no. There's nothing like being part of a phenomenon. I yeah. It should happen to everybody. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. Lovely. Exactly right. Yeah. Well, fans of my show know you for playing Major Hayes on Star Trek Enterprise, which was cool. I I, I liked him. I liked him a lot because he he you know, he represented his unit. He was very protective of his unit, mm -hmm. and I liked him. It, it was a great uh, con a natural conflict between him and Malcolm Reed's character. You know, right. it was just that was so cool. And then credit you and Dominic, especially at you know it, it came to a head when you had that fight. Yeah. And that that was just such a great it's like when acting is really good it's like watching a tennis match going back yeah. and forth mm -hmm. and you guys really brought it to that particular scene and that oh, was really good. something good yeah it, it was a lot of fun i my one you know regret is that you know originally hayes was supposed to be when i originally went in for it they said oh you know I, they're going to have him in like 10 episodes and was ended up being in i think 5 or something but i would have liked to have had a little bit more build up to that episode where Dominic and I finally finally fought. Yeah. Because it, it just seemed in a way to come out of nowhere. You know, it, Hayes I think made a brief appearance in in the the season premiere and then then I did one episode with them where basically I felt like what do they call it, the red shirt guy? Yeah. yeah. Where but I said, "Okay, you know, I'm I'm Steve McQueen, you know, I'm I'm strong and silent and uh you know, I only speak when it's important, and and so that's the presence I tried to to bring into it. You know, I, I literally did think Steve McQueen. I was, I I watched him in the Magnificent Seven again. You know, and thinking, yeah. and I was, you know, unfortunately, you know, the difference is that in the Magnificent Seven, he's got he's got all these props. You know, he he shakes his his uh, shotgun shells and he tilts his hat and he does all this stuff, and unfortunately. The, none of the props that I had were workable. <laughs> yeah. So whenever I had something like, if, is there something I can adjust on the gun? Is there a radio? Is there, I was really, I was very like, okay, how can I use this object to to you know advance my character? So, uh, but anyway, yeah, when we got to that one episode uh, where um, Dominic and I had the fight, it was it was a lot of fun. I I met, uh, we did a. Um, uh, a stage reading of a radio play for KCRW uh, in Los Angeles, like a couple years before that, and we oh, okay. met, and uh, you know, we go to the same gym, and so uh, you know, and so I'd seen him periodically, you know, over the years, and you know, he's just a great guy. And when I got cast as Major Hayes, I called him. I said, like, you know, guess what? You know, we're working together tomorrow. So, uh, uh, and he was very excited about that. But the the fight was fun. The fight was just um, the kind of thing that the in a film, you know, they take a week filming, and we basically had a couple hours split up over over two different afternoons. <laughs> yeah, that's television. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's uh, what it is. A lot of fun. Now, that wasn't actually your first time on the Enterprise, though, because you were actually the first officer in Star Trek Nemesis. Yes. And that scene was cut, but with the magic of DVDs, we can all see it. You know. Yeah, you know, it was, uh, you know, originally. They sent me, you know, the material for the the movie, and I just saw this tiny little scene, and I said, "Well, no, you know, this is a tiny little part. I don't want to do this." But then, uh, um, over the weekend, I read the script. Um, as I was sitting, my my twins had just been born, so as I wow. was sitting, you know, feeding one of them a bottle or getting one of them to sleep, uh, I had the script on my lap, and I would, uh, and I was reading the script, and I thought it. It, 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 I thought it was a really great script, and then I read. Then I got to the end, and I went, "Oh, oh, well, this would be really cool, you know, to, to sort of come in and make this cameo appearance and do the and fly off as the new first officer." And so then I, I got kind of enthused about it. And originally, I was going to do it for no credit, you know. I my name wasn't even going to be on in the movie. It, I just wanted to do it as this sort of cool little cameo and fly off. But then, you know, I'd heard that the movie was like, you know, two and a half, two hours and 45 minutes long or something. And things, 
started to be cut, 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 and I thought, well, that scene's going to go. And, and sure enough, it did. Yeah. Although I have to say, when I saw it on DVD, I didn't think I was very good. <laughs> I don't yeah. think that's the reason they cut it. Yeah. But I, I, I don't think I, – I just didn't like myself in it. That's just my opinion. Well, I mean, it's always nice to, to, to work walk on any Star Trek set, though, and be part of history just to walk on yeah. it. So yeah. that's kind of yeah. – you know. uh, But I thought I could have been better. Mm-hmm in that. So I, I was glad to get a chance to kind of redeem myself with uh with Major Hayes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was neat. It was it's really cool. No, I, I I liked uh I like I liked Enterprise. I just thought they hit their stride way too late and they had uh lost their viewership. Um, yeah. And it was really a shame. But but it, they really went out on a very high note. That last season was incredible. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, you know, one of the best. But for you personally, that was a pretty busy year because you were doing JAG and also West Wing in addition to Major Hayes. And ER. And ER. So that was uh, that was a lot of, I mean, uh, credit it, your it scheduler. Was very, it was a very busy year. Yeah, uh, I would say. And uh, I have to say, you know, it was uh, – and there were only a few times where it got a little dicey uh, where there was one time when I was filming – I think it was, it was the episode – I was doing, I was doing a, a show called Lion's Den with Rob mm-hmm. Lowe. And I was on the Paramount lot till about four in the morning, and then I had to show up at nine a.m. the next day to be on Enterprise. Wow! And I had like a thirteen-hour day, so so occasionally, and then I think when when we were working on the fight that episode, there was a little bit of tension because I had to be on the set of ER the next day, so we had to get it wrapped up. And the great thing was that I have a really good manager uh, who is who is always like the eye at the center of the hurricane. And, um, <laughs> is very calm and, you know, makes everybody else calm. And then all the shows that I worked on, just they were they were very accommodating and they were great. You know, <laughs> if, if, if the producers, if there's a good atmosphere on the set, it, it, it bleeds down from the top all the time. And, uh, you know, I'd worked with JAG for many years. They were always really accommodating, you know, uh, West Wing. I mean, they, they, were, all, they were all terrific, and, <laughs> and that made it – that made it easier, but I will say that I, I actually originally missed out on the part on Desperate Housewives because um, I was um, dying a heroic death as Major Hayes that day and I didn't <laughs> make it to the network test. Well, look at that. How about that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it all worked out, so that was good. Oh, yeah, it all worked out. That was good. Just to give you an idea of how these things have a life, uh, I actually saw you this summer in Spain on an episode of JAG. <laughs> oh, yeah, they, yeah. yeah. We're so, big over there. We're big over in Europe, uh, JAG. Yeah, yeah. so, it, you know, it, those are still playing, and, of course, you know, DVDs as well, so that's, uh, that's a whole other yeah. life, too. Yeah. I mean, you've done your share of guest starring roles, too. Um, what's that like when you have to kind of come in and, you know, and, and just kind of play with these casts and, and, and then just have to leave when it's all done? I've been very fortunate, I think, in the casts I've worked with and the shows that I've done, you know, only occasionally has it gotten a little weird and, and I'm not going to, but, but if it's ever weird, it's because of the atmosphere of that particular show. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I have to say for the most part, you know, the sets I walk on to are really great. You know, I just finished doing two episodes of Eli Stone uh, for ABC. The, the first one I think is airing next week. Oh, and, cool. Uh, you know, just walk to the cast read through and, you know, Victor Garber and, and Johnny Lee Miller. I mean, they just, they could not have been more open. And, and, and Natasha and I had worked, we actually did a science fiction miniseries, uh, last spring, Natasha Henstridge and I, um, mm-hmm. it's called Impact. Oh, uh, yes, which, yes. Yeah, keep an eye out for. It. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to air in the states. It's it's like a um, it's an international production, and it's already been sold in Europe, and it's going to be showing there, you know, sometime in the fourth quarter. But it was uh, uh, starring you know David James Elliott, you know, from JAG. Which yes. Is, and uh, it was wonderful to reunite with him and Natasha Henstridge and James Cromwell, and the, I got to play the president this time. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Um, and it was fun. Uh, but anyway, so I so. You know, when I walked into Eli Stone, you know, there was Natasha, and I don't know, and they were just great. You know, they were terrific. But you know, but every, but every, pretty much most of the sets that I walk onto are are really glad to have you there. And my work ethic is such that I always come in really prepared. And I think 
people really appreciate that. You know, I come in prepared. I come in with ideas. I come in, you know, with ideas and ready to listen to other people's ideas. You know what I mean? Sure, and, sure. And, and I'm very much at home, you know, so it's, it, it's kind of a great job for me. Mm-hmm. You know, but I think people really appreciate it, you know. Oh, yeah. And, and I don't, you know, only rarely am I intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you certainly have done your, you know, your share of sci-fi. I mean, you know, Star Trek, of course, and even Stargate, and then shows oh, like right, Meeting. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, so um, what's it like on those particular shows? I, I think the climate is nowadays where there used to be a stigma against doing those shows, you know, for for some actors years ago. But that's gone away because you can literally jump from Enterprise to Jag and this, and nobody's going to blink anymore. Yeah. Well, you know, the climate has changed a lot. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I was. You know, I I collected comic books when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. You know, and and you always felt like it was something you had to hide. Now, you know, who would have thought that comics would be such a huge money making industry and and you know sort of the vanguard of Hollywood. I mean, yeah. And Comic Con, you know, was oh, yeah. this huge deal. So so the climate really has changed a lot. It's interesting. You know, you know, sci-fi, you know, kind of has its origins, you know, at least on film and TV, in, in sort of cheap productions. You know what I mean? Yes, exactly. And I still think there's a vestige of that hanging around, at least with like Stargate. You know, they're they're pulling in tons of money, but they're as you know, when when I showed up on the set, you know, and and, and had a delightful time with David Hewlett and yes. his his sister and and, uh, and Kate. And uh, you know, the first scene, you know, I said. Uh, you know, it was almost like we were going to leap in to shoot it, and I said, um, can, "Can we rehearse this first? You know, can we can we rehearse? Let's 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 talk about this and rehearse it for a minute." And David's like, uh, "Make sure they don't shoot it." <laughs> 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 I mean, they, you know, we they we just plowed through that sucker, mm-hmm. uh, it, and uh, you know, it was fun. But uh, I thought, man, you know. Yeah, they work on the fly there, no doubt about they it. Really do. Yeah, they, they, they do. really do. Um, quick, yeah, that yeah that role was was interesting. Uh, um, you know, they had actually sent that script to me, and and I had just actually come back from San Francisco where I was doing another play, mm-hmm. and uh, that had been very you know demanding and challenging, and I was really in the mood to just sort of keep that energy going. And they sent me this script, and I read the script, and I went, I don't have the slightest clue. <laughs> How to play this character? I don't know where to begin, so I should say yes. So you know, I, I said so. I, I accepted the role just because I I thought, oh man, I don't know how to do this. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I don't know how it came out, but uh, it um, but it was it was fun to do. Yeah. Now you have a, a couple projects uh, that I like to talk about that are I don't know if they've been out yet or coming out. One is from called From Within. Yes. You play Pastor Joe in that. Mm-hmm. What what type of a uh, film is that? It's a horror film. And oh, I, cool! And I said, um, you know, after my last horror film, uh, which shall remain nameless, I said <laughs> I'm never doing one of these again. But you know, they sent me this script. It was actually, you know, at least the first half of the script. I mean, I found it genuinely spooky. Oh, good! It was it was genuinely creepy. And the role, you know, I mean, I basically I flew in on a Thursday and I was done. By um, Sunday, you know, mm-hmm. back on Sunday, all my stuff was squeezed into just a couple days. And the director is this wonderful, wonderful DP, uh, uh, Faden Papa Michael, who shot, you know, uh, 310 to Yuma. Oh yeah. W. He shot, and he's he shot uh, uh, Walk the Line. There was there was one scene where I'm preaching to you know my congregation mm-hmm. you know and there's the band in the back and the you know it's it's very like you know tell you know evangelist type thing and and Faden was saying you know this scene you know we would have shot in in three days on walk the line and you know basically on from within we shot it in the morning before lunch wow what they did was i mean when i got there i i really was kind of excited about it because they really do shoot it in this kind of we shot in this very small kind of beaten down town in Maryland and they really just wanted to it, it was very atmospheric and subtle you know and and they really wanted to get a certain look to the film and I and I think um you know so that the creepiness was mm-hmm. not hitting you over the head just it was part of the part of the atmosphere 
Right. And um, I, you know, from from what I saw of it, I thought they they did a really good job. It's been in a lot of uh, film festivals, and it's just been picked up by a European company for distribution. Oh, good, good. So, but it's but it's 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 won some awards at some film festivals, and it's it's kind of making that circuit. But it's a it's a small little independent film, but it's got a great you know Thomas Decker is one of the lead, Elizabeth Rice. Oh yeah, he's uh, he's big now because of Terminator. Goldberg, yeah. Um, it's got a good cast, and Faden was was it was great that that he directed this as, as a DP, you know, and he had it, his crew working. And if you're going to shoot something fast and cheap, it's great to have somebody who really knows what they're doing and mm-hmm. what they want, and you know, boom, it, it's you know, and can make it happen. And and they were a great group to work with. Oh, that's cool. And then also there's a one called Leaving Barstow, which, yes. which Barstow is in California. I know that. So, Yeah, and, yeah. That's also making the film festival rounds. That was uh, one that another little independent film where they send me the script. It, it's it's a great character. It's not, it's not sci-fi or anything like that. It's, yeah, yeah. It's more of a, you know, human, you know, coming of age drama. And oh, play, nice. Uh, kind of a, a burnt out, you know, a high school uh, physics teacher who – takes this smart kid under his wing and tries to encourage him. But there's also stuff going on with my character that you find out through the film, literally what's eating him, you know? Oh, okay. It, it really is it's just about the acting there. And, and Peter Page, um, who was an actor himself uh, and who's directed a couple of films, uh, directed it. And it was, he was, it was really good. And, and the way they shot that, you know, he had, it was shot in a way it was very kind of fluid, mm-hmm. and you never quite knew where the camera was, mm-hmm. and, and there was something very improvisatory about it and spontaneous, and, and it was really good for the movie. Um, oh, cool. To work on. Yeah. Oh, cool. That sounds great. Yeah. Oh, two good, two interesting projects to look forward to. Right yeah, there. yeah, and, it, and so. uh, you know, the, um, Leaving Barstow is one. I know it won the Audience Award at the uh, uh, Long Beach Film Festival, and Nice. It's, it's done quite well at a bunch of other festivals, you know. You know, I don't know, you know, if it's going to be picked up for distribution or not, but it's, but it's definitely making the rounds. What's nice is eventually everything heads to DVD. And, yeah, yeah. And that's such a great market too. I mean, it's, I mean, DVDs is a billion-dollar market, so it's just incredible. So. Yes, and that's, you know, that's what part of what the SAG is fighting about right now yes i know i know yeah it's uh yeah and it's just the whole industry has just done a a 180 from uh from what it used to be you know and uh, before you just negotiate for movies and television and that's it yeah Yeah. you know and now it's like online you know uh, dvd you can pick up you know you can pretty much watch anything online right now i know uh, i know so it really it, it, unfortunately it's really cutting into actors incomes yeah because yeah. you know we're not making any money from the reruns anymore and and you know that's kind of how you lived uh, sure that you were able to continue pursuing your career uh because the you know when you get paid for an episode you know the the residuals for the reruns it's kind of like deferred payment mm-hmm. sure now a lot of the deferred payment is being taken away and, and they don't want to give us anything for online or dvd so it's so it's kind of uh, we'll see we'll see what's happening that's huge changes yeah i i think they'll i think they'll realize and they'll eventually have to you know pay you i mean just like they did with the writers i mean they had to do something well yeah yeah uh, but but the writers deal is just the first step right it, it yeah it wasn't you know there's still a lot of holes in that deal but it, yeah. it was you know it was on the right track anyway yeah, it's going to take a while, but I think eventually, you know, everybody will, uh, you know, will get what they deserve. I mean, I'm well, let's, let's hope. Let's yeah, hope. yeah, you know, absolutely. Not just in our industry, but yeah, uh, but everywhere. Yeah, it's just a very, very different world, and I even find myself watching a lot of television on the internet. It's really funny, and it's just, it's just this thing where, you know, you can always watch it either on TiVo or on, you know, and not what it airs because sometimes you don't have the time. And, uh, right, right, and then yeah. and then you get impatient. I'm I'm very impatient watching anything in real time now. Yeah, me too. Me too. You know, I I won't do it. Yeah, I hear uh, you. I'll record it and watch it later. Yeah. So I can skip the commercials, which which then sort of knocks hole in the holes in the whole financial structure of the way at least mainstream TV works. Oh yeah. It's advertiser driven. So, oh yeah. So what are you going to do? 
Uh, lots of lots of things to be ironed out in the new century. Absolutely, it's like great technology, but whole new set of problems. It's right, amazing. right. As always. Yes, that's the way it is. That's the yeah, way it is. Yeah. I really want to thank you for taking the time to speak to me. I've had a great time and, and looking over some of the things you've done and, and a lot of memorable roles. I mean, it's uh, yeah, yeah. I've been I've been very fortunate. You and, know, uh, you know, it it seems to keep happening. So. Uh, not many actors can say I played Bobby Kennedy not only once but twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's pretty good. I mean, certainly an icon of the 20th century, and and, and yeah, to, yeah, it's a privilege. And to be on series like you know Star Trek, once you're in one of those, it's like you're 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 part of history. It just doesn't uh, yeah, and never I goes do, away. You know, I I am very much appreciative of the whole Star Trek, just to be part of that. Mm-hmm part of that history because it just seems to me that you know the whole mythos of it revolves around some kind of optimistic feeling about about the future and that that cultures and societies and stuff finding ways to work together and live together you know and and I, I just think that's a really important message to be you know continuing to carry I mean especially the original series you know? yes but yes. beyond that uh, it's just you know there was there's a a real message of optimism there. Absolutely. Uh, so it's nice to be part of that history. Oh, absolutely. Well, thank you again. It's been a pleasure. This is Tony Talato. Thanks again for listening.